So yeah, um, the third session for today is on atom probe tomography instrumentation. So, uh, so far we've talked about, um, you know, in the introduction, what an atom probe roughly looks like and in the field of operation physics, what actually happens on the tip or near the tip. Um, but the question is now, how can I have an instrument that allows me to do those experiments? Uh, this is uh, something that obviously most of you are going to be confronted with on a, on a daily basis. You know, you have this uh, big thing that looks like a, uh, like a big espresso machine, essentially, uh, and it does funky things. Um, but I think very often people think it's a bit of a black box and it's very much not. Yeah? Um, and I think understanding, um, understanding how everything works really will make you a little bit more comfortable in terms of what the boundaries are of what you can do with the instrument. Yeah? Because these days, a lot of people want to do in situ experiments. You might want to have reaction chambers. You want to have God knows what uh, with the with the um, with the vacuum system, um, or you uh, or what's something that actually uh, is is uh, uh, important to everyone is you know you have a, a data file and um, with some atom probe with some hits in there or with some detector events in there. And the question is, uh, what now? Uh, maybe it doesn't fit together with, um, with something that, that you've done in, an, in, a, in, a, in another instrument uh, or with something that you know about your sample. For example, you do, I don't know, you measure um, gallium nitride was the example from earlier or was it aluminium nitride? I don't know. Um, and uh, you know that the stoichiometry is like bang on uh, because it's a perfect wafer that you get. But the atom probe tells you, I don't know, you've got 40% uh, nitrogen and 60% gallium, and you're like, this can't be. Yeah? Um, so I think for us, it's important to understand how the acquisition process works uh, in order to, under to understand our data a little bit better. And these are the, the two main aspects that we're going to look into, uh, to showing what the instrumentation limits are, why the instrument is the way it is, um, and um, yeah. Uh, and uh, what what we can expect from the data, and um, yeah, I, I, I believe probably some of you are also in charge of uh, you know maintaining the instrumentation. So it's always good to know how everything works, you know where you can uh, where you can touch the instrument without breaking anything, and where you better keep your fingers uh, fingers away from. Okay, so uh, what do we need to to probe atoms? Uh, I should have taken the probing out because there is no probe anyway. What do we need to field evaporate to ion or sublimate atoms and capture them? Um, and the first thing we need is obviously we need a specimen. Yeah? We need a specimen. Um, that specimen needs to be at a temperature, at a low temperature, so that we don't get too much surface diffusion um, and none of the other nasty effects we talked about in the last session. So about 20 to 100 Kelvin usually. Yeah? Um, so 100 Kelvin would mean liquid nitrogen te temperature and liquid nitrogen would be good enough to, be good enough to cool it. Um, below that, we're going to need some other means to do that. Um, liquid hydrogen is, by the way, an extremely good coolant for atom probes, but uh, yeah, for safety reasons, uh, it's not that popular anymore. I don't think anyone right now in any research I've seen uses liquid hydrogen as a coolant anymore. But maybe we will, we will in the near future for, for some materials testing here. Um, Anyway, uh, you need an electrostatic potential. You need to supply a high voltage. It is actually relatively trivial. You can buy high voltage power supplies. Uh, you just need one with a uh, with 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 a ripple low enough that you know that your ripple doesn't influence the, the the do we know the potential bit of the master charge calculation. <coughs> and uh, usually, from some one to twenty kilovolts much more doesn't necessarily make much sense because the sample is probably not going to survive it. And uh, from a safety perspective, uh, you're moving into totally different high voltage connectors once you go beyond 20 kilovolts. Um, then you need a time reference, so we need a voltage pulse or a laser pulse. Um, then we need a clean vacuum, uh, and that's usually the one thing that you, that you that uh, that jumps at you right when you look at the atom probe because that's most of what you see is the vacuum system. Uh, and we need a single particle detector, which is either time resolved you know, for a 1D atom probe. We're not going to look into that too much because <coughs> it's actually relatively trivial. It's just an MCP and an anode behind it. 
Um, but these days we're gonna look at um, spatial resource detectors and specifically delay line detectors because all atom probes currently in operation use delay line detectors. I don't know of a single atom probe right now that's not using a delay line detector. Um, yeah, and that's why we're looking at delay line detectors. They're not the only spatial result detectors. In the early days um, of tomographic atom probe, people used to use wedge and strip detectors. Um, they came from astrophysics. They're not particularly capable when it comes to, um, uh, when it comes to multi hits. Uh, and then the group in France used multi-anode um, multi uh, array detectors. Um, they also have some multi-hit problems. So delay line detectors all the way right now. I'm not saying that's gonna be it forever, but that's it for now. Okay, uh, so uh, the first thing we're gonna look into is um, the um, overview of an atom probe, UHV generation, and detector technology, voltage pulsing, and laser pulsing. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, for most of you, using atom probe will mean using a LEAP atom probe. This is an early one from 2004. So this is from the very first manual for an atom probe that we had in Sydney. Um, and so I took that one because it doesn't have uh, it doesn't have all the different uh, like covers on it, so they don't didn't hide that much at the time. Now you've got a lot of uh, industrial designers saying, okay, it needs to be a panel there so that people don't see inside. Uh, we see, we've seen it with a lot of um, scientific instrumentation. And in a way, it's not that bad because over a long period of time, UHV systems tend to accumulate dust on them. Uh, so when you take them apart, keeping the dust from going into the vacuum system is a bit of a pain. So I'm, I'm not adverse to having uh, cover panels everywhere if it, ke if it keeps your atom probe from, from, uh, from picking up too much dust. And so a typical system actually consists of a, an analysis chamber and this is where all the magic is happening. Yeah? So this is where you have all the, the, this is where you have the specimen, where you have the cooling, where you have the detector and everything. Um, and because we're at such a high vacuum, we, it's, it's really impractical to move specimens directly in there because you will see we, we actually need to heat up the entire instrument in order to get rid of contamination to get to the vacuum levels that we need. Uh, and if you would need to do that every single time when you exchange your specimen, um, that would just be impractical for atom probe. I mean, there are other people that do that. Now, there are people, for example, in scanning tunneling microscopy that might spend their entire PhD on one single sample um, that actually do it that way. Uh, they open the system, they put in the sample, uh, and then they close it and bake it. Or our colleagues in physics that work on, on, on field electron emission, they have systems like that. Uh, they open the system, put the sample in, close it up, bake it, and then they're happy for a couple of months. In our case, what we have is a, a, a transfer system usually. So we have a buffer chamber. Uh, we have a buffer chamber, which is for storage of samples uh, and having them slowly outgassing, I guess, also. Um, and we have a load lock chamber. And this is just to maximize, to maximize sample throughput. Yeah. If a sample throughput isn't that high, it's fine to just put a load lock onto a main chamber. Yeah. Um, that's still very practical. I know, for example, our colleagues in Russia, in Moscow, um, their atom probe doesn't have a buffer chamber and they can only put in one sample at a time, but for their purposes, it seems to be fine. Yeah. Uh, our atom probes um, all have buffer chambers and load lock chambers. Um, our field ion microscope currently also have one, but on the field ion microscope, for example, the buffer chamber is more of a hassle than it actually, than it actually helps. So I might get rid of the buffer chamber. So it's not always helping, you know, sometimes it's just annoying because you have an another step that you need to do. Yeah. Um, but that's usually the, that's usually the setup. So we have a, a, a an, an air going uh, system here, where we go down to maybe ten to the minus six, ten to the minus seven. So not bake. Uh, we go into baking in the next step. Um, and here we've got a here we've got two chambers that are actually baked. You know, baking the load lock is pointless because because you're going to open it anyway. Uh, on the leap, the, the configuration is that the, the load lock is on top, and then you have the buffer chamber at the bottom. Um, this is for space con constraints. Most other systems have the load locks on the side because every time you open the load lock hatch, you've got dust coming in from the top. And every time you open the, the latch from the, uh, um, from, the, from the load lock to the buffer chamber, any of the dust that fell in falls into the buffer chamber. So um, yeah, that setup is vacuum wise, not the optimum, but yeah, it does the job. So who cares, right? 
Good, uh, then we have a cooling system here. We're gonna talk about the cooling system later. Um, we have got a detector set up here and the pulsar is usually external. Okay, so the very first thing is we need to go to a vacuum levels. Yeah? And just to illustrate what kind of vacuum levels we can have in, um, in, in, in various techniques, um, where usually we talk about uh, four different vacuum levels. Yeah? So we can have a rough vacuum level, uh, which means we have some kind of mechanical pump um, that is uh, that is pulling out whatever gas we have in our system. Then we have a medium vacuum that goes from, this goes to, uh, so Pascal's is 10 to the two um, to uh, in, uh, compare to, so this is atmospheric pressure is 10 to the four. Yeah. Um, so we've got a factor of, uh, of 10 to the one, uh, two, two millibars. Yeah. So one hectopascal is around one millibar. 100 pascals, yeah. So here we go to about, um, yeah, we go to about 10 to the minus one uh, millibar. Uh, here we go, we go to about uh, 10 to the minus three millibar at medium vacuum, yeah. also still mechanical pumps. Um, then high vacuum, uh, it's now a matter of definition, uh, say 10 to the five, 10 to the minus five, 10 to the minus uh, five millibar or 10 to the minus three-ish, uh, so no, uh, 10 to the minus five uh, Pascal, 10 to the minus uh, seven, 10 to the minus eight um, um, millibar. And then we have ultra high vacuum, and this is usually where we do our measurements in, uh, and this is sort of 10 to the minus, um, 10 to the minus eight to 10 to the minus 10 Pascals. So 10 to the minus eight pascals is uh, sort of uh, where we are uh, where we are about with with our atom probes usually. Um, back in the old days, people uh, didn't use that high vacuum. So 10 to the usually I talk in millibars. Uh, so 10 to the minus seven pascals, 10 to the minus nine millibar was not unheard of. Uh, so uh, the vacuum levels that we're working at are not necessarily always required. Uh, but you can also go into the other direction. For example, in our uh, titanium atom probe, uh, we have 10 to the minus 10 pascals, roughly uh, 10 to the minus 11, 10 to the minus 12 millibars, so even higher vacuum. Depends on what you want to do. Yeah? Um, but the thing is, um, we, need a, we need a good vacuum so that we don't get a lot of surface contamination. And uh, in this case, we also need a, a, a uh, um, a large free wavelength. So if you had atmosphere in your atom probe, on average, every 68 nanometers, your uh, your atoms would, uh, your ions would collide with a gas atom that would obviously not be very helpful. Uh, we want them to fly freely up to the detector. Uh, and in UHV, the free, uh, the mid free, uh, the mean free path is in the kilometer, kilo kilometer range. Uh. So collisions between uh, contaminant molecules and uh, your, uh, your atoms are actually extremely, extremely rare. rare. Yeah. And this is usually where we sit, we're sitting. Yeah. So here we've got our atom probe and here we've got our FIM. Yeah. Um, and this is what we need to get to. Um, and the problem with that, with getting to those pressures is that we have um, guess uh, that the reason why we need to go, they go to those pressures, even though uh, the mean free paths are relatively large is that the gas equilibrium pressures are strongly temperature dependent. Yeah? So if you're at the measurement temperatures of, a, of an atom probe, you, uh, you get a lot more absorption, yeah? a lot more sticking of the molecules than you would get if it was ambient pressure. Uh, if, sorry, if it was ambient temperature. Yeah? And you can see the satur saturation vapor pressure, essentially the, the absorption tendency uh, of, um, the absorption tendency of different species uh, depending on temperature, and you can see it, water, CO2, and so on and so forth, they have relatively low saturation vapor pressures uh, at the temperatures we're working at. Yeah? So we're working at 10 to the minus eight, 10 to the minus nine pascals. Yeah? And at these pressures, uh, at, at these pressures, uh, when we say, okay, um, uh, sorry, at the temperatures we're working at, um, this also, this already means that CO2 uh, water vapor, CH4, and partially oxygen can uh, absorb to your specimen. The reason why we don't see oxygen, pure oxygen in our atom probe measurements, but only see water peaks is that 
uh, there is hydrogen coming out of the chamber walls that reacts with any spurious oxygen. So as long as you have a hydrogen surplus, you're never going to see free oxygen. You're always only going to see uh, water vapor. Okay. Uh, we don't have to worry that much about hydrogen. And yes and no, we'll see uh, what the limitation there is. Uh, so we will get cold field evaporation. Yeah, but these, these would be the big problems uh, that, that don't really go away. Um, and the problem with that also is that um, the, uh, the, these pressures are at the equilibrium pressures. Yeah? And depending on what the, this, the surface adsorption isotherms are, it can take quite a while to get to those equilibriums. Yeah? Especially water vapor is very important for us. Yeah? Because if you open your system to, to ambient pressure, what is going to happen is that you get essentially a monolayer of water vapor condensing onto your, uh, onto your, onto your uh, specimen, uh, sorry, onto your specimen, into your chamber or whatever you've opened up. And one, once you pump it down, it can take very, very long for the water vapor to, to leave. Yeah? Um, and this is what we, uh, what we have here. Yeah? So here you can see um, for a certain sticking energy, uh, kilojoule per mole, yeah? how long will it take for one monolayer to dissolve? Yeah? It doesn't mean it necessarily have one monolayer, but this is just ex as an example for one monolayer. Um, and uh, according to, to a certain pressure, yeah? And you can see at the, uh, at the times, uh, at the pressures we are working at, 10 to the minus eight pascals, yeah, it's about 10 to the seven seconds or about a year. Yeah. So you can go to, go to that pressures, but it will take very, very long. And we have some colleagues that really bake the systems because they have a couple bunch of different systems. And when they open one, it's fine. They close it up. They wait for a couple of weeks and then the pressure is where they kind of want it to be. Yeah. But you know, it's not really practical if you have one system that you depend on to really wait for long enough, um, um, for long enough for that to happen. And uh, how long it takes is dependent on the sticking, um, on the sticking energy. Yeah. So for the worst molecules, they're about a hundred kilojoules per mole. Yeah. About a hundred kilojoules per mole. Uh, it will take about a year, but if you have much, much larger, um, sticking uh, energies, it doesn't matter either. Um, because, um, um, because they, they just won't leave. They ju will just keep sticking. So this is for one monolayer to come off. Yeah. If the monolayer sticks there, it doesn't come off. Yeah. So at high enough energies, they don't come off at low enough energies. Uh, they do come off and anywhere in between that's sort of our problem area. Yeah. And this is at room temperature. And you can see here, this is some, some uh, basic uh, physical chemistry measurements where you can see some of the sticking. Uh, so hydrogen uh, on on uh, on various surfaces. You can see what the the energies are there roughly. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I haven't found a proper one for uh, uh, for for uh, water vapor on stainless steel. Or do I have one? No, I don't think I have one for water vapor on stainless steel. Um, but you can assume that somewhere in a uh, not particularly good range. Yeah? Um, but if you if you increase the temperature, yeah. So this is f uh, 573 Kelvin, a typical bakeout temperature. Uh, you will see that the, the maximum, uh, even for 10 to the minus eight pascals, uh, the maximum time for a monolayer to come off uh, is about, yeah, it's, it's some tens of seconds. <clears throat> Obviously, usually we bake our system for longer than that. Uh, for longer than that, the main reason for that is that they very often we have thermally well insulated parts of our system and the heat needs to go everywhere. Yeah. And that's why we can't, can't just heat it up for a couple of seconds and then cool it down again. But we rather need to, you know, keep it at temperature for a little while. Um, typically 24 to 48 hours. Yeah? Uh, anything longer we only do on new systems where you, for example, have um, a water vapor that comes out of polymers because polymers can take up a certain percentage of their weight in, 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 in water vapor and that just comes sl out slowly. But once that's, that's done, every time you open the system, you know, you might take 24 to 48 hours uh, of bake out. And a typical bake out temperatures are somewhere between 120 degrees C and uh, 150 degrees C. And the reason for that, uh, for atom prop tomography, and the reason for that is below 120 degrees C, the water vapor is not coming up properly 
uh, and above 150 degrees C is really the limit for the microchannel plates. Yeah? So you're gonna start damaging the microchannel plates. So this is sort of the window we're working at. Uh, but just mind you, every time you, you can open an atom probe, that's not a problem, but every time you do that, you have to heat the entire system up to that temperature. And especially when it comes to laser atom probe, not your entire system will be able to do that. So you have to disconnect all kinds of things, uh, heat it up to your baking, and then reconnect everything again. Yeah, for a voltage atom probe, there's not that much that you connect, so it's relatively easy. But for a laser atom probe, it's a lot more work and re realignment. And so usually you will need Kamika for that or someone that help you for that. Unless, of course, it's your own system, then obviously you can do that yourself. Um, okay, so our standard vacuum uh, chamber materials are stainless steel 304 and 316. They are just uh, uh, austenitic stainless steels. Uh, the 316 one is with molybdenum. And it's usually used uh, wherever uh, we have electropolished chambers. In the leap chambers, for example, they are all electropolished. Yeah. Um, and uh, they just they just have good weldability. They're easy to polish, uh, and they have a good corrosion resistance. That's why even very old um, uh, UHV systems are usually uh, in, in very good shape. So this is one of our uh, this is one of our chambers for the field ion microscope. Where, for example, see another electro polished one, uh, and this is just what, what a typical chamber looks like. And most component uh, components are available in stainless steel three or four. Uh, and only some in 316 and 316A. But if you do electropolishing, you usually go for these because they don't uh, tend to, to form pitting, uh, pitting on, the, on the stainless steel chamber, which um, can make the, uh, which, which usually is a trap for dirt, uh, and we don't like dirt in our system. Um, so what is the problem with these materials? Yeah, uh, or what is good about using metals? Why are we using metals? The main reason we're using metals is because they don't outgas a lot. Yeah? They don't outgas a lot means um, if you take, for example, neoprene yeah, as a polymer, or I have no idea what araldite is. Maybe one of you knows what araldite is. Um, they will have a degassing rate. Yeah? Uh, that means that it, that you cannot establish ultra high vacuum, yeah, not at all, and that's even before you start uh, taking in the f the the, uh, the fact that you can't heat that up to the temperatures that you that you need to bake. Yeah. Uh, but the de -gas the outgassing rate is actually uh, very low um, per um, for for these uh, for the, for metals. Yeah. Um, so here you can see it's in Pascal cubic meter per second and square meter of chamber. Uh, you can see stainless steel is actually a pretty good choice. Um, aluminium is actually better in terms of outgassing, um, but the reason why we don't usually use it is because it's relatively easily damaged. Uh, and we'll get to, to uh, why that's relevant uh, in a couple of slides, because the way we connect individual components is through so-called CF flanges, conflage flanges for ultra high vacuum and they are knife edges. Yeah? So we don't have rubber seals, we have metal seals, and those metal seals, they sit on a knife edge, and you know, if you bump your aluminum chamber the wrong way, your knife edge will be gone and you have to throw out the chamber, and that's why we usually uh, don't use aluminum unless we can avoid it. What's missing on here is titanium. Uh, titanium performs even better than aluminum, um, but uh, costs a little bit more, not that much more. So I personally don't understand why not all, uh, from what I've learned in the last two, three years, I don't understand why, why not all atom probes are made from titanium. I see no reason to use stainless steel, but anyway, that's, that's what's used right now. Um, and uh, the reason that we have problems with stainless steel is that it has hydrogen, it, it is a, it's a host for hydrogen, and it has hydrogen permeability. Yeah? So you can see here that the, the permeation constant for hydrogen for different metals. Yeah? Uh, and you can see, okay, this is low, um, low carbon steel. Um, this would be even worse. Uh, this is austenitic steel, uh, austenitic steel. Um, and the permeation constant, depending on temperature, um, is uh, much higher than, for example, for aluminum. Yeah, unfortunately, titanium is missing here. Um, and so if you uh, look at a uh, spherical bulb, I don't know what it took 1.6 centimeters and one millimeter wall thickness and just look at how long it will take for the pressure to rise 
in that um, um, in that uh, uh, in that steel. Uh, we can see that essentially for our usual steels, it goes pretty instantaneous, and if within uh, within a year, you know, it would probably be almost at ambient pressure. Uh, for copper, this would, for example, be much slower uh, than for stainless steel. Uh, and this is essentially the reason why we're always measuring hydrogen in atom plot tomography, uh, not because it's in your sample, but because it permeates uh, from your uh, stainless steel, which has a certain amount of hydrogen in it, which is not in equilibrium, so it wants to get out, uh, and it can diffuse into the vacuum chamber and then just, you know, live there. Um, essentially what happens is individual, so in the stainless steel, it sits there as an individual atom, uh, then it just plops into the, uh, into the chamber uh, and then uh, recombines to hydrogen two. It can't leave just as a single hydrogen, but as hydrogen two, it leaves and then it absorbs somewhere. Uh, this is why you can have alternatives. Uh, you can have aluminum chambers, you can have titanium chambers. Uh, we're not gonna go into the details of, uh, of it, uh, but I highly recommend if you build something, use titanium chambers, they don't cost much more. Um, so this was, the, uh, this was the, 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 the metals part, but we will also need ceramics. Uh, we will need ceramics because we will need uh, insulation here. Yeah, we need electrical insulation for thermal conductivity. Uh, and for this, we use ceramics, and most ceramics are pretty okay to use in uh, ultra-high vacuum. Uh, uh, the, mo the, the ceramic you will find the most, though, is so-called Marcor. Uh, this is machine a machinable glass ceramic. It's pretty expensive, pretty pricey, uh, um, but you can use it uh, as a, as an, you can actually drill it, you can grind it, you can machine it, uh, so you can get it uh, into any shape you want. Uh, and with that, it's very useful ultra vacuum technology. Um, there's also Chapal, which is an aluminum nitride, which has a, so this is a glass ceramic, so it doesn't have a particularly good thermal conductivity. Um, um, with Chapal, we have uh, this an aluminum nitride, which has very good thermal, or reasonably good thermal conductivity. And that's also something we use a lot. Uh, anywhere where we need direct thermal conductivity, this uh, we use, uh, we usually use, um, we usually use sapphire. Yeah. And uh, these days, sapphire is not as expensive anymore, and it can be cut with, uh, with lasers. Yeah. So for the, for the, for the uh, sapphire parts in my stage, I paid about 1,500 euros, yeah, so it's not super, super crazy expensive. Um, uh, one thing that's also starting to take off here is people are starting to build a lot of things using uh, 3D printing. Yeah, there are uh, multi-photon 3D printing companies that can do extremely good accuracy and in ceramic 3D printing and are fully, fully vacuum compatible. Yeah. So here we've, we've seen changes. The reason we use macro is because we can machine it. And if you can 3D print it, you don't need to machine it. So you don't need to use macro. You can use zirconia, you can use alumina, yeah, stuff like that. Um, we, some, we very often also need to use polymers. Yeah? And with polymers, we essentially have polymers that we can use in high vacuum and polymers we can use in ultra high vacuum. Yeah? Um, and this is actually more or less the limit between high vacuum and ultra high vacuum. In high vacuum, we've got polymer seals, yeah? usually Viton seals, it's a fluorocarbon uh, rubber. Yeah? Um, and um, in ultra high vacuum, we usually have either Teflon yeah? or a PEK or, uh, or a, a polyimid. Yeah? Polyimid in the form of Kapton or in the form of Vespel. They're just both trade names. Um, so um, Viton is usually our KF seal. So if you've got pre-vacuum and so on and so forth, it's, it's this fluorocarbon. Um, and uh, also our UHV gate valves use those as seals. The only downside of them is that at a high temperature they will reduce, uh, they will release some hydro, uh, some HF, hydrofluoric acid. It's obviously not particularly good. Yeah. Um, um, the um, Teflon is UHV compatible, um, but the problem with Teflon is that it hardens and breaks down under radiation. Um, so especially if you do field eye microscopy, that's not particularly helpful. Yeah because you've got a lot of radiation coming, uh, so we usually avoid Teflon, um, but you can use it in UHV. Um, in, 
for example, the, the um, UHV TM from Nyon uses a lot of Teflon. Uh, we usually use PEK or polyimid, yeah? Kapton or other polyimid, um, and they are very well compatible. You, they, they are, they are, um, you can get them to their bake out temperatures without any problem. Yeah? Um, and uh, polyimid is higher, has a higher temperature stability. Um, PEK you can use to about 180 degrees, polyimid to about 250, 260 degrees. It's not uh, that precise a cutoff, but sort of the, the range. Um, and the only downsides that they have is they take up a one, two, three percent of the weight as the moisture when they're stored yeah, in ambient uh, conditions. So once you get them into ultra high vacuum, it's a good idea to, to leave them in ultra high vacuum for a little while so that that water can come out and be, uh, and, and be released. Um, or if you do that you, you during baking, it, uh, it just initially bake a little bit longer. I mean, it takes a little while for the water to get into the material. So once you get it out, if you've got the chamber open for a couple of minutes or maybe an hour, it's fine. If you had it open for, an, for a day or two, maybe they've taken up moisture again. So for you as an, uh, for you as, as, a, as, as someone applying Adam Prop, the important bit is PEK because all of the insulating parts in the local electrodes in the Kamika atom probes are PEK. And this is the reason why you need to leave the local electrodes in the buffer chamber or the load lock for a couple of days before you use them because the PEK will actually emit water vapor. Yeah. So just make sure you don't just take the, the local electrodes, you put them in and straight up use them. Yeah. So just wait a little while. Uh, okay, we're not gonna go to the details. They're just stuff for you to look up. Yeah. Um, if you do, if you want to 3D print stuff, uh, there's uh, one nice paper from 2014 where they've tried certain uh, certain things or, and what they uh, um, uh, what they do in vacuum chambers. Yeah. So if you get some kind of uh, 3D printed material, essentially all the plastics are not compatible. Yeah. So acrylic, for example, you'll have a lot of stuff outgassing. So this is a residual gas analysis uh, of the materials, but uh, if you have metal 3D prints, they're actually pretty well ultra vacuum compatible. And I think this is actually gonna move us in Adam Probe forward uh, quite significantly because if we can come up, for example, with an open source FIM or open source Adam Probe, where you can just 3D print the, the most of the parts, um, I think that will make Adam Probe a lot more accessible to a lot of people. Um, okay, so how are these parts connected? So obviously the machine will need to spend, will, will need to consist of a, a lot of different parts. Um, and they're connected with so-called CF flanges, which stands for conflat flanges. Uh, and these uh, have so-called metal, uh, they have metal seals. The metal seals are usually copper. Uh, sometimes you can get indium seals, but usually they're copper. Yeah. Um, and there are different, uh, different types of them. You can get them annealed, which means they're softer. Uh, you can get them unannealed and they're a little bit harder. So if you have something dangling off of your, uh, off of your system, it's probably better to use a little bit harder ones. Uh, if you have uh, viewing glasses, uh, which you know are very, uh, very sensitive to, to twists and everything, it's maybe good to use one of the soft ones. Uh, and you can get them coated with silver or uncoated. The ones coated with silver are important if you wanna bake to high temperatures because the pure copper can, can stick to your CF flanges if you bake out to high temperatures. If you just bake to moderate temperatures, you don't need the, the, the silver ones. Yeah. But I'm a little bit paranoid, so we use the annealed silver ones quite a lot in my lab. Uh, the important bit uh, about the CF flanges is that when you open them, uh, uh, when you close them up again, uh, you need to essentially tighten them up like, a, like your car tire. Yeah? So across the first this one, then 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 this one. And you need to tighten them up with, uh, with specific torques. Yeah? So you need to use a torque wrench to tighten them up. Um, we don't always do that. We do that when we can, you know, sometimes a little bit tight for a torque wrench. Yeah? But I guess after, after having tightened up a lot of uh, flanges with a torque wrench, you get a kind of a feel. Yeah, and, uh, your hand becomes your torque wrench your arm becomes a torque wrench and then, um, then you can do that. Uh, these flanges are standardized and I've never seen a non-standard CF flange on any system. Yeah? So if you look at your atom probe and you think like, hmm, 
can I put a part on there that I buy off of a vacuum vendor? Yes, you can. They're all compatible. Yeah? There's very distinct sizes. Yeah? And once you've seen enough of them, you just look at the system and know which size is which. Um, and so if you have an opening, you know, if you go back to our sketch of the leap, yeah, you will, for example, notice this is a CF63 flange. Um, you can open it and put some other CF63 flange thing on there. Yeah. So these, they are all compatible. Um, there's nothing magical about any, any CF flange. Okay, um, if you design anything um, that goes into your UHV system, the one thing you need to, uh, you need to remember is that uh, when you pump it down, you need to have escape routes for your gas. Yeah? So if you have any, any uh, holes yeah, that end in your, in, your, um, in your part, you, for example, need to have escape holes yeah, so that air can get out. Yeah? So this is a part from our field line microscope, and you can see there's two holes uh, coming in from the side and then there's always a drill drilled hole from the side that we don't have air pockets yeah. um, you can do that by the way both ways you can either uh, drill a hole in here and make sure the air can get out or you can get special screws that have a hole in them so that the air can go out through the hole uh, or you can uh, you can take you can get screws with a slit on the side yeah, uh, with the same purpose uh, the other thing you have to consider is that during baking you will have thermal expansion yeah so you also need to take care that if you have materials combinations, the thermal expansions are taken care of. And the most important uh, thermal expansion that you're gonna have is in your viewports, because uh, in your viewports, you're gonna have glass and you're gonna have metal. Um, and so you have you usually have some cova or some other material. So cova is called cova because it has the same expansion coefficient as the glass, uh, so that the, the thermal expansion can be uh, equilibrated to, to some degree. Um, and this is something you always need to take care of because otherwise your, your viewports would all break during baking. Yeah. And that's something we obviously do not want. Okay, so let's get into the UHV generation. So this is, so now we have a chamber uh, and we have made sure we don't get a lot of outgassing. So the question is how do we get to the, to the vacuum? Um, and the first step is actually uh, that we need roughing. So there is currently no pump in existence that can get you from ambient pressure down to UHV with just one pump. Yeah, so you're always going to have a pump that uh, a system that consists out of at least two pumps. Yeah, one that gets you a roughing pump that gets you from ambient pressure to some intermediate pressure. Yeah, and one pump that gets you from uh, that intermediate pressure down to UHV. Yeah. Um, and uh, we're going to look at the roughing pumps. So which roughing pumps do we have? Um, and then which pumps do we have to create ultra high vacuum? Yeah. Uh, and there are two pumps that are important for us. That the one is turbo molecular pumps. They're essentially mechanical pumps. Yeah. So you give the molecules a good smack. Um, and the other ones are the getter pumps. They're chemical pumps. Uh, so you adsorb or absorb um, the uh, molecules that are left in your work chamber. Yeah. So here uh, the molecules are removed. Here the molecules are buried. Yeah? So getter pumps don't get rid of the molecules, they just incapacitate them. Uh, and here this is a layout of a basic system and I'm sorry I forgot where I picked up the sketch from. Um, and here it's uh, drawn in a way that the roughing pump sort of evacuates the whole system and then the UHV pump uh, works independent of the roughing pump. But very often these days we've got two molecular pumps where the roughing pump continuously backs the, the, the UHV pump. Yeah. And of course we have got a gauge, but we're gonna go into the gauge uh, technology later because that's also important for atom probe operation so that you know um, what the pressure that you see in your atom probe actually means or if it actually has a meaning at all. Yeah. Okay, so roughing pumps, essentially we've got um, four different roughing pump types that are used for, for atom probe tomography and field line microscopy. Um, so um, all of them have different ups and upsides and downsides. And uh, in the LEAP systems, for example, Kamika uses membrane pumps uh, and they're very, sim very simple pumps. So you have a, a, a polymer membrane, a diaphragm, and uh, you have, a, uh, you have, a, a, you have a, a motor that just moves the diaphragm up and down. Uh, and then you have valves uh, opening and closing valves that make sure that the gas can only go into one direction. 
is a very very simple a very very simple system it's dry yeah? so you don't have any oil in there that could go into your system and ruin your vacuum for good uh, they are very silent uh, or relatively silent they don't cost a lot of money and they get you to about one to two millibars and if you look at your leap there's also there's always a roughing pump gauge and it will say okay what the pressure is and you know sometimes you're in the, in the less than one millibar range but usually you're sort of in the millibar range you know if it goes above 10 millibar it's probably because the, the membrane is starting to die and then you need to exchange the membrane that happens every two to three years now yeah, you will need to ex exchange the membrane but they're very good pumps uh, and a lot of the modern turbo pumps they can actually deal with uh, with with not so good backing pressures yeah so having a much better backing pressure doesn't actually uh, get you much better uh, results Another pump that's used quite a lot are so-called rotary vein pumps, yeah, where you have these, uh, s these essentially these, these plates that are moving onto an e eccentric, uh, uh, eccentric uh, actuator, yeah, uh, and they draw in uh, they draw in gas uh, from one side and then compress it and push it out on the other side. Yeah. Um, they're oil lubricated, not just oil lubricated, but also oil sealed. Yeah. Uh, and this is the main downside of them because the oil. Uh, just imagine you have a um, you have a blackout at your facility, uh, and then suddenly, psh, you know, uh, a lot of air comes rushing in from that side because your pump might not keep the vacuum anymore, and you have oil in there, and your oil might get pushed into your system. Uh, so we usually avoid rotary vein pumps uh, for uh, ultra uh, vacuum systems. Uh. You can take some precautions so that you can still uh, use them, yeah? but uh, if we can, we avoid them. But they 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 are affordable and they get us a, a very good vacuum, about ten to the minus three millibars. Um, if you want to get to the same uh, to the same level, there's also scroll pumps, and they're getting increasingly uh, more popular. Where you have two scrolls, usually made from Teflon, yeah, that move. Uh, that move in an eccentric way relative to another uh, and uh, compress any gas from the inside this way and push it out on the uh, in the in the um, in the middle of the of the pump uh, they are very 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 versatile pumps uh, and they get you to about five times 10 to the minus three millibar 10 to the minus two 10 to the minus three millibar so also very good vacuum um, the downside is that they that they are significantly more expensive. Yeah, four or five thousand euros. So here we're talking it may maybe thousand euros, fifteen hundred euros. Same about here. Uh, here we're talking four or five thousand euros, three thousand at least. Um, and the downside is because these these uh, scrolls rub on each other, you will get Teflon dust in your system. Yeah, it's not as bad as having oil, um, but the Teflon dust can be a problem as well. And especially if you have uh, systems that are constantly at vacuum, yeah? constantly at ultra high vacuum, there is no gas current that carries out those particles. So they will just sit there and the, the, the wear will just accumulate. So they're, they're particularly good for load locks, yeah? for buffer chambers and for main chambers, not as good, yeah? but still all right. Yeah. Still all right. Um, uh, the best pump I personally think are so-called roots pumps. Yeah? Uh, and in a roots pump, you have two uh, two pistons uh, that roll on each other, um, and these two pistons uh, do the compression work. Yeah, and usually um, roots pumps um, can have multiple stages. Yeah, so you have a bunch of roots pumps behind each other. And the great thing about them is they're dry. They so you don't have an oil problem. They're extremely clean, and they get into an extremely good uh, vacuum. Problem is they're fairly expensive. Yeah. 5,000 euros maybe, yeah, so they're pretty expensive, but you know, mm, you can still afford it. Um, but the biggest downside of the roots pumps is they're extremely, extremely loud. I've got a bunch of roots pumps in my lab um, and my PhD students hate them because if you're in a lab with a roots pump, you can essentially only sit there with, uh, with, with the earplugs because they're, they're extremely loud. Yeah. Uh, if they weren't so loud, if you have a separate room where you can put them far away, uh, they, they're essentially uh, probably the best pumps as a vacuum pump, yeah, but they are re they're really loud. Um, okay, so the membrane pump, so this is the, the membrane pump that used to, I don't know about the 5000 and 6000 series, but this is the ones that used to be used. They're very widely used pumps from Pfeiffer. Uh, 
uh, and you can see that uh, they go down to about a millibar or so. Yeah. Um, okay, so these are roughing pumps. Yeah. Uh, and if you want to go to higher vacuum, well, we usually use uh, tubo molecular pumps. Uh, and a tubo molecular pump is essentially a, just a kinetic pump. The, the very earliest ones were just rotating cylinders. So what happens here is that on the, on the, uh, on the inlet side, uh, a molecule sticks to the surface, and then you have a cylinder in this case that rotates so fast that the average speed of the molecules when they, when it, when they, uh, when it desorbs is such that there is a pressure differential between both sides. Yeah? So even though modern tubo pumps look like they work like turbines, they don't. Yeah? They, work by, they work by mechanically giving your molecules, your gas molecules, an average speed into the exit, their exit direction. Yeah? What that means is that they are differential pumps. Yeah? So they are not absolute pumps, they are differential pumps. So you have a, uh, a, 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 a ratio of uh, pressure in to pressure out, yeah? uh, which is uh, exponentially dependent on the blade velocity and a geometry factor. Yeah? But <coughs> the faster we spin, the better that works and um, the better geometry we have. Yeah? Um, but the important thing is we create a pressure differential, yeah? not an absolute pressure. Uh, so the backing pressure matters, but most modern tour pumps also have free pumping stages, uh, which are providing, um, uh, which, which are making sure that even if your backing pressure isn't that great, uh, the backing pressure will be uh, sort of increased by the pump itself. Um, and essentially, yeah, it's just a matter of you've got a rotor and a stator, uh, and if your molecule absor absorbs, uh, when it desorbs, uh, it has an average, uh, it has a, uh, a higher probability to go to the exit than it has to go to the, uh, to the entrance. Um, okay, uh, this is a modern, this is a modern, uh, uh, a modern tubo, pr uh, tubo pump, uh, essentially the one that you'll find in the LEAP systems, but also in some of our systems. And you can see here, uh, you've got the uh, initial tubo pumping stages, and then you have some stages that are essentially making sure that, you know, the pressure here doesn't need to be super, super high in order to get to ultra high vacuum on this side. Um, the, the, the good thing about these pumps is they're extremely clean. Uh, they're extremely clean. They can get you from relatively moderate pressures uh, down to, so it's uh, from backing pump pressures down to UHV. Uh, and we'll see that getter pumps cannot do that. Uh, but essentially they get you from the pressures that these pumps uh, leave us at down to UHV. Um, and they're very clean, they're very easy to maintain. All you need to do is change the, the bottom bearings every couple of years. Uh, and this is really the great thing about, uh, about those, uh, uh, about those uh, pumps. And by now there are special uh, pumps that can really get you down to the 10 to the minus 11 millibar regime. Uh, so our turbo pump, the best ones we, we got with the ones that we have is low 10 to the minus 10s. Uh, we can get to that pressure. Um, but newer ones, you can get to down to the 10 to the minus 11. So essentially you can have an add-on probe with really, really, really good vacuum with just tubo pumps these days. So that's not a problem at all. Um, yeah, you can see the pumping efficiency, uh, how that changes with, uh, with, uh, uh, with pumping, um, with, with, with pressure, uh, um, at just at, at high pressures, they're not as efficient. Uh, and the imp most important thing is they have a certain compression ratio of different, different elements. So they're particularly efficient for heavier elements and the lighter the elements are, because we're working with uh, momentum, and the lighter the elements are, the less efficient these pumps are. Um, and of course, that means hydrogen, yeah, they're not particularly good at, at pumping hydrogen. Yeah? The heavier, the better. Yeah? Hydrogen, not so good. Uh, you can see that here as well. Um, yeah. Um, the only problem that we have with turbo pumps is they're spinning extremely fast, so they are very susceptible to mechanical damage. Uh, um, so if you, for example, in Japan, where you have a lot of earthquakes, turbo pumps don't like earthquakes. Uh, the, other, the other thing is if you have an inrush of air, uh, same story, a lot of mechanical force into your pump, and will just, uh, you might just break it. 
Uh, we haven't broken a turbo pump on an add-on probe yet, but we have broken turbo pumps on electron microscopes, for example, where you know there was a problem with the software, uh, and we broke turbo pumps here before. Yeah, so turbo pumps can be broken, and uh, the piece, the bits and pieces, can fly around and damage a lot of stuff. Uh, so, um, yeah. Uh, one good example is there used to be one chamber in, in the group in Rouen that they had on an air table yeah, on to, to reduce vibrations. And someone, I don't know if someone just rocked it or hit the air table and the entire, <laughs> entire tour pump uh, just blew up. So the tour pump itself, the casing is strong enough to contain all the blades, yeah, but the blades might just fly into your measurement chamber and destroy a lot of really expensive equipment. Yeah. And that's what, th that's what happened with our uh, friends in France. Yeah. So yeah, vibrations, not a good idea. There's also a reason why, for example, the vacuum transfer suitcases you see a lot these days in atom probes, they don't have tuba pumps for that reason. Yeah? Because you know, if you shake it, well, bang, it's the end of your tuba pump. Um, okay, uh, the other important uh, pumping for EHV is sublimation and getter pumps. Yeah? And they work on the principle of chemisorption, yeah? Uh, where the uh, sorption energy on whatever surface we expose to our um, to our residual gas uh, is actually so sticky for the molecules that they don't leave. Yeah? And a good example is uh, so, uh, oxygen on metal surfaces usually has about 12 to, 16, uh, to 17 kilojoules per mole sticking energy. Yeah? So there's no pumping. Yeah? Uh, and if you remember back to our earliest graphs here, uh, uh, if you remember that sort of, you know, this, this is just, it, it just means it will come off very easily. Yeah. But if we have, you know, a thousand kilojoules per mole, it will never come off ever once it sticks. Uh, and this is, for example, what happens if you have oxygen on blank titanium. Blank titanium means titanium without its oxide layer. If you've got the oxide layer in titanium, you, you essentially at a situation like up here. Um, yeah. And so the, the, then the, the, uh, um, the time for, uh, for molecules to come off essentially depends on the ratio between this energy and, uh, and RT. Uh, and so we want to make this energy as, as, as high as possible. And so the question is, how do we create blank titanium? Uh, if I just put a piece of titanium in my chamber, it's not going to do anything. Uh, but we need to have blank titanium. And with titanium and a lot of other metals, we can actually heat them up to high temperatures so that they can... Phew, swallow their own oxide, so the, ox the oxygen from the oxide actually becomes uh, a solute in the material, and then you have a blank surface. Yeah? And that's very often the way that we work. Um, and um, for those getter pumps, uh, they have certain uh, adsorption energies for different molecules, uh, uh, and essentially um, some molecules are more reactive than others. Yeah? Uh, so you can see, for example, these are getter efficiencies for uh, barium films used to be used as a getter in, back in the days quite a lot if you had a, an old TV. Yeah? They, they had vacuum as well, and these vacuums were maintained by getters, yeah, and barium was a very popular one. Yeah, so you can see anything that's reactive, hydrogen, oxygen works very well, but the less reactive the molecules are, the less efficient the pump is. Yeah? But of course, the main elements we have to deal with are the ones that we introduce from our atmosphere, and it's nitrogen, oxygen, argon. Now, argon doesn't react at all, so maybe mm, noble gas is not that great pumps for noble gas. Yeah. Okay, so the first way uh, th the first way to create a blank metal surface is just to evaporate the metal, yeah? just to sublimate the metal. And they are so-called titanium sublimation pumps, TSPs. Uh, some of the leaps I don't know if all of them still have them, used to have titanium sublimation pumps. Yeah? And what you do there is you have a titanium wire, you heat it up until it's glowing pretty well, uh, and then the titanium just uh, is coated onto some surface, and that surface then pumps. Uh, we have a TSP on our, fi our field ion microscope, for example, uh, um, and there it does the gathering there. Uh, the other way uh, to do that is using a so-called non-evaporative getter pump, and this is uh, the physical uh, phenomena that I explained just before. We just have an alloy that you heat up, yeah, or a metal that you heat up for high enough that it swallows its own oxide, and then you have a blank surface. Obviously, uh, if you create special alloys, then this works a little bit more efficient, uh, and uh, 
very often you've got zirconium aluminium, zirconium titanium, zirconium molybdenum mol uh, aluminium alloys that are companies that specialize in, in making those non evaporative scatter pumps and they have their special alloys to do that. And the good thing about the non-evaporation getter pumps uh, is that uh, they have very high absorption capacity, especially at the pressures we're working at. So um, yeah, you do the uh, you do your absorption cycle. Yeah, you, you you heat them up and then they will absorb for a long time. But you can saturate them. And um, for example, recently I've taken apart an old atom probe in Leoben that had a, a non-evaporative getter pump. And it's been cycled so many times that the that the getter has been reduced to dust. Yeah, we took out the getter pump, and really all of the getter just came out as, as dust eventually. Yeah. So they have a limit on the amount they can sorb. Um, they uh, they're especially good for hydrogen because they can reversibly sorb hydrogen. So all other things that they sorb, it's usually permanent. Yeah, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, uh, it's permanent. And uh, but hydrogen is reversible. Yeah. So if you heat them up, you can get rid of all of the hydrogen again, and then it swaps hydrogen again. Yeah, so for example, you can, uh, you can combine a non evaporative getter pump with a turbo pump, and you've got a very good atom prop system. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so they just sit there and just do their thing uh, without you having to do anything. Um, in the uh, LEAP systems, uh, what we have are so-called uh, um, uh, iron getter pumps, IGPs, uh, you've probably seen IGP pump a lot in the in the user interface there, uh, and ion getter pumps are essentially um, a dynamical version of creating one of those sorption pumps. So what you do is you have a uh, you have a gas coming in, and you're trying to ionize those gas atoms and accelerate them towards a cathode, uh, and there they will either get buried or sputter some titanium or whatever material uh, they the cathode is made of, uh, and that sputtered material will then um, will then be deposited on the anode, yeah, and work there uh, as as absorption material. Yeah, so you've got twofold action. Uh, first of all, you bury your, your elements, yeah, so even non-reactive elements will be pumped, yeah, which here you're not going to pump any non-reactive elements. Yeah, so if you've, if you've got argon, helium, any non-reactive elements, no pumping action whatsoever. Here you've got some reasonable pumping action. Yeah. And you always create fresh uh, surface with some fresh metal uh, that can also chemisorb material. Um, yeah, and uh, I think in the interest of time, I, I think I have to start moving on. Um, they have some downsides as well. The problem is um, they, um, you need big magnets in order for the, for the, for the ionization to work well. So they're pretty heavy, yeah. So you essentially your only chance to mount them is below your system, yeah, which isn't usually, in, especially if you want to go onto a uh, onto a um, um, optical table or something like that. Yeah, not really great. Yeah? Um, but they're extremely robust, robust in pumping. They're made for semiconductor equipment. So even if your if your vacuum would be ten to the minus six millibars, they would live for fifty thousand hours. Yeah. Um, so they live at, at, and it linearly goes down with the pressure. So the pressures we are working up, they, they're like new when you open them after 10, 15 years. Yeah. Um, the problem with that is though that the ions that you create, they can escape your, yeah, they can escape your pump. Yeah. And if you have an atom probe, they can get sucked in your detector. So uh, in the leap systems, you always have shielding around the detector in the entire flight path just simply so that the ions from the pump don't get sucked into your detector. Um, yeah, once, uh, if, if you don't have to deal with it, it it's good if you don't, <laughs> yeah. Um, but apart from that, they're extremely robust. Yeah, they do their job day in, day out. Uh, even if you have students that are not as careful with their vacuum system as they should be. Yeah? And this is why for commercial systems, they're usually the, the, uh, the pump of choice. Yeah? Uh, of course, these days, um, um, with modern turbo pumps, I think a switch to turbo pumps is very realistic. Um, I think the, the colleagues in Stuttgart, they have mostly only turbo pump system, but maybe with a, a non evaporative getter pump for the hydrogen. Uh, but these are very, very viable and very good systems as well. 
Okay, so this is for the for the pumping, and now that we only got a half an hour, I think I'm not gonna dwell too much on the cooling and the the, the measurement stuff. Uh, anyway, so we need some cooling. Yeah. How do we cool down to the temperatures that we need? Um, we can either have an open system. Uh, open system means you have to have some supply of a coolant, usually liquid helium. Uh, if you're in a physics lab, you might have that. Best thing ever for atom probe. Uh, apart from liquid hydrogen, which, you know, safety issues. Uh, but usually these days we've got closed cycle cryostats. Uh, and uh, closed cycle cryostats, um, there are a couple of different versions. Uh, there are Stirling cryostats, and, uh, um, which are very efficient. And there are Gifford McMahon cryostats, which have the upside that your compressor is um, away from your, uh, from your actual cryocycle. And this is why the, these are relatively affordable and in most atom probes. Actually, all of our, our atom probes and FIMS work with Gifford McMahon cryostats. Um, if you build a lot of systems, it might just pay off to have liquid helium in your system, uh, in your lab. And uh, these days, there are also uh, systems where you can have a Gifford McMahon cryostat produce liquid helium for you locally in your system, and then you use that for cooling. Yeah. <clears throat> but I haven't seen anyone use that uh, because it's a little bit expensive. Um, so the cryo generators that we use are uh, Gifford McMahon cryo heads, uh, cryo generators, and you you know the typical sound when you go into an atom probe lab. The tick, 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 tick. That's actually the sound of the displacer and the regenerator uh, of the uh, cryostat uh, switching over. As you can see, the two valves here. And essentially what they do is uh, they compress helium, yeah, take the heat out of the helium, um, move the compressed helium into the cycle, and then you expand the compressed heliums. heliums. Uh, most uh, of the cryostats that we use in atom probe are two-stage cryostats, so you don't only have one stage, uh, but you have two cooling stages. Uh, they have a somewhat reduced efficiency over Stirling cryostats, uh, but beca uh, but because of the uh, because the compressor is separate from the cryo head itself, um, yeah, they're just cheaper to make and especially cheaper to make with good power. Yeah. Uh, most cryostats have about a uh, a watt at 4.2 kelvin, so at liquid helium temperature, and about 200 watts at 80 ke ke kelvin. So they have they have quite some power. I think on our atom probe we have most probably the most powerful cryostat on any atom probe. Uh, just a bit of overkill, uh, uh, but they're also getting a lot cheaper because they're widely used in, in, in MRI systems in, in medicine. Yeah? So you get these standard MRI system uh, cryostats and they're more than good enough for Adam Pro, probably a bit too big. Um, this is the one that's used in, in our LEAP. Uh, that's one from Sumitomo, uh, but I think Kamika has been switching cryostat manufacturers quite a, f a few times. So yeah, anyway, it's a typical uh, power range of those. Okay, and the final piece of our vacuum system and cooling system are the ionization gauges. Uh, um, and uh, the reason why we have ionization gauges is because we need to measure at uh, the ultra vacuum. And that doesn't work through like membrane-like uh, measurements anymore. Instead, what we do is we ionize the residual gas in the, in the chamber and measure the current that we can produce through that. And we can either do that with a hot filament or we can use do that in cold ionization gauges. Uh, and both are actually used in, in all kinds of atom probe instruments. Um, the hot filaments, they have no magnetic field and they're very simple, but they produce heat and they have a finite life. Uh, um, the cold ionization gauges that are almost a little bit more prevalent. So in the leap, you have one of those in the buffer chamber. Uh, all of the other chambers use cold ionization gauges um, they have the ability, they, they give off no heat uh, and they're very simple, uh, very simple systems. Uh, but the problem is they have a magnetic, uh, magnetic field uh, uh, and they essentially, they essentially small versions of this. They actually completely identical to these uh, pumps, but smaller. This is why the pump itself can also be used as a pressure gauge. Uh, um, and uh, yeah, um, um, and uh, the, prob this, the problem is the same as with the, with the pumps, they can emit ions back into your system. And the reading depends on the gas type. Um, um, and we're not gonna go into the details of how they work. The most important thing is 
that uh, the pressure reading that you get depends on what gas you have. Yeah? So unless you know what gas, what gas composition you have, uh, you don't know exactly what your pressure is. And you can see uh, the correction factors, you know, for helium, uh, it's 5.9, which means if you measure a certain pressure and it would only be helium, the real pressure would be almost six times as high. Yeah. So always uh, remember that. Um, I think they, they, the guys in Gothenburg, they put an actual residual gas analyzer onto, onto the leap. So then you can look at partial pressures, but I, that's, I think the only system I've ever seen uh, currently in operation doing that. Um, back in the days, people uh, used to do that a little bit more. Uh, I, know I know the system in Berlin, for example, they used to have a residual gas analyzer uh, on it as well. And I know that because I sort of inherited that system. Yeah. But uh, the pressure reading alone doesn't tell you the whole story. Yeah, that's the, that's the main thing. Okay, um, for rough vacuums, uh, we, use, uh, we use Pirani gauges. Uh, uh, Pirani gauges are very simple. You have a wire uh, with, a, uh, uh, with, a, um, um, uh, with a current running through. The current hits the wire and then you have convective cooling of the wire. And so by measuring the resistivity of the wire, you can tell what the pressure is. And that works kind of pretty well down to about 10 to the minus three millibars. Uh, and this is why we have them as pre-vacuum gauges. Uh, uh, these days there are schemes uh, like, uh, like micro pirani gauges and, uh, uh, and ramping pirani gauges that can get it down to the 10 to the minus four to 10 to the minus five millibars. Uh, what would be really, really nice is if Pirani gauges could get you down to 10 to the minus six, but that doesn't seem to be uh, anywhere on the horizon. Yeah, but 10 to the minus five, MKS makes, uh, makes Pirani gauges that go down to the 10 to the minus five, which can be good enough for a load lock. Yeah? So, yeah. The good thing here is they're extremely robust, so you know you can have an inrush of air and they're not gonna care very much. Um, so yeah, so you can see we have different, uh, different uh, pressure ranges. Uh, where we can uh, where we can have different uh, different ionization gauges. Uh, usually, we have ionization gauges exclusively uh, for ultra high vacuum measurements, and then we have so called wide range sensors. Sorry, this is in German. Weitbereichssensoren, wide range sensors, which are usually a combination of ionization uh, and Pirani. Yeah? And so when you when you pump down the load lock, at some point there will be a discontinuity in the pressure measurement. And this discontinuity comes from the pressure gate switching from Pirani, uh, from its Pirani part to its ionization part. Yeah. Okay, so in the last 20 minutes, we're gonna move into the detector because this is uh, the heart and soul of the whole atom probe experiment. Uh, and the detectors that we're using these days, they are so-called microchannel plate detectors. Yeah. Microchannel plate detectors plus delay line. Yeah, so we have a, a single particle, yeah, so a single atom, uh, single atom ion or very small cluster ion, and we need to detect it. Yeah? And the signal that the single ion creates, there's no electronics that you can use to read that out, at least not, uh, at least not in a reasonable way. So there's no amplifier that you can use to just amplify that single atom signal. So we have a pre-amplification stage, and this is what our microchannel plates do. Yeah? So they are our first line of amplification. And what they do is our atom or our ion impacts onto, uh, onto that microchannel plate, and we get an electron avalanche out on the other side. And we're gonna look into, the, into that in, in detail later on. So then we have an electron cloud, but we wanna know where and when this electron cloud was produced. And that's what the delay line does. Yeah? The delay line is essentially just a wire strip. Yeah? It, it, you don't need to have a meander, you can just have a wire strip. Um, and um, the, what happens is the, uh, the electron cloud uh, uh, hits that wire meander and then propagates in the wire meander. Yeah? And what we do is actually measure when that pulse that is created uh, hits the end of the, of the line. Uh, hits the ends of the line. It's obviously two ends. Yeah? And, we're, and if we look, uh, if we want to know the position, uh, we take the average of those pulses, the average time of those pu pulses with respect to a reference time. If we just want to know the position, we just need to know what the difference in time is between the two pulses. Yeah? We don't need a reference time for, uh, for, for position encoding. 
We only need the reference time for time encoding, yeah? but we'll get into that later. Yeah? So these are the two stages. And then we have some readout electronics, which are also very important for data interpretation. But first, let's jump into the microchannel plates yeah, and look at what they do. Oh, sorry, this is the overall. Yeah. So we have the microchannel plate. Yeah. We create uh, the electron cloud. And I unfortunately don't know where I stole that sketch from uh, because it's actually not a particularly good sketch because it looks like the wires are connected at the end. They are not their meanders. Yeah? So they're, they're serpentines. Yeah? It goes dip, dip, dip. It's just one wire from the beginning until the end and not a wire array. Yeah? But what happens is you get a pulse from the electrons. Yeah? So you have a little bias voltage here across uh, sucking the electrons from the MCP onto the delay line uh, and then it moves out. And here we've got some examples of that. So this is a a uh, wire delay line from Röntgen, and you can see with the wire delay line you've got the problem that you need to have the wires uh, go out quite a lot further than the actual detector area just because in this case we've got a redundant delay line uh, so it needs to go out much further in order for the you know for everything to have, to have its space there uh, whereas here we've got the planar delay line from the colleagues in Rouen uh, uh, which have put everything on a PCB and this is actually what most modern delay lines are like. Uh, here, th by the way, this is the signal of a tungsten atom at 3.7.35 kV impacting on the detector in our atom probe. And you see for the X direction, you've got two ends, X1 and X2. Uh, and you can see, okay, the X2, uh, the signal at, at X2 arrived before the one at X3. So here we've got time versus signal. Uh, so it was closer to X, X2. So if this is X2, so yeah, it would, would be somewhere down here. Uh, and in the y direction, we don't have as much difference, but we're closer to um, y2 than to y1. Uh, so in the y direction, uh, it would be um, it would be closer to y2, so it would be somewhere up here. Yeah? And this is how the position encoding uh, happens. Yeah? What we see here is actually the trace. Yeah? So this is done with an oscilloscope. We'll see later in all almost all modern atom probes, certainly the leap series this information is not preserved. Yeah? So what we get is we just get a time measurement from each of those channels. Yeah? We don't know what the pulse looked like, if there were two together or whatever. Yeah? This is information that is unfortunately lost, uh, but I'm very positive that uh, at some point we're gonna have all of that information. Okay, so how does the MCP work? MCP works very simple. Uh, we have two glass plates, so the MCPs are just glass plates with holes in them. Yeah? Uh, and there's a voltage between the front and the back. Yeah? So we've got conductive coatings at the front and the back, and we can put a voltage there. So each one of those, uh, each one of those holes is a little scintillator. That, has, that means one thing, uh, two things. First of all, if the atom doesn't hit in the hole, it's gone. Yeah? And that's why we have a finite detection efficiency. The second implication is that um, any resolution uh, any resolution the detector is limited to the whole pitch, yeah, because any we can't really say where in the hole an atom struck. Yeah, we don't know if it was more to the left, more to the right, or whatever. Yeah, so the whole pitch is a resolution limit. Um, another thing, uh, and sorry, and the third, the third result from that is we have a certain angle in which the atoms hit, yeah, and we have a certain angle of those glass holes. Yeah, if those were straight down, zero degree, yeah you wouldn't see any of the atoms that come straight at the detector. It's something we don't want. Uh, instead, we have some channel angle. Uh, and you can buy those uh, multi micro channel plates actually with various channel, channel angles. And usually in atom probe, we go for the highest channel angle where we can still get a plate with a reasonable pitch. Uh, might be 20 degrees. Um, there's a typical channel angle here is for general purpose micro channel plates. So in atom probe, they're more like 20, 20, 22 and a half degrees are our plates, I think. Um, and I'm fairly sure the ones in the Kamiki atom probes are exact same plates, actually. Um, and um, yeah, and so this is, um, this is sort of the limit of what's reasonable in terms of field of view. Um, if your field of view, yeah, if you move your specimen very close yeah, and your acceptance angle is very large, you will have just have something called a blind spot. Yeah? So you would have an area of the detector where it's just not detecting ions because it just flies straight through. 
Um, most MCPs that we have are also MCP stacks. So we have two MCPs on top of each other, yeah, so that we increase the MCP gain. Yeah, uh, and they impedance match so that we only need one power supply. Yeah, so we might have about two kilovolts uh, of uh, two kilovolts of voltage across the MCP stack uh, that does the amplification. And then we might have another couple of hundred volts or maybe a kilovolt between the MCP stack and the um, uh, and the anode. Uh, and this is important for us because it means we have some kind of potential on the detector. And you will see tomorrow that actually has an influence on something called the, Im uh, the image compression factor or the image compression in general, because usually it's uh, the easier thing is to have the back of the anode. Yeah, sorry, this, uh, this is just a phosphor screen, yeah, but we use our, our delay line anodes. The back of the anode uh, is usually at ground potential, yeah, so that you know you don't electrocute yourself when you when you put your cables in. Um, but you can actually circumvent it. Yeah, you can have a high voltage filter box in between, essentially just capacitors, um, and then put the uh, put any potential. Uh, you yeah, put the front at any potential you want. Yeah? And, and one of the instruments we operate here in Erlangen, which is uh, actually an electron spectrometer, uh, for example, has a front entry potential of ground, yeah? which means the back then would be about two and a half to three kilovolts. Yeah? In most atom probes is the back is at ground, so the front is at minus two point something up to three kilovolts. Yeah? And the good thing about that is it it sucks in the, the, the atoms, yeah? so we get more atoms because we suck them in, yeah? we compress, compress the image, and that's why we usually do that. But it also means that when we do our reconstruction, we should probably take care of that because that changes then during the evaporation, uh, when the evaporation voltage changes, um, and also uh, it means that our calibrations get a little bit more complicated. Um, if you do that uh, with an atom probe where the in front entry potential is ground, um, essentially you need no you need no correction for the for the. Um, essentially, you can just use the basic physics to calculate the mass spectrum without any error. Uh, so makes it very handy from that perspective. But you're missing out on a fair bit of this. Okay, so the MCP channels. Uh, there's a couple of manufacturers where you can buy them from. Um, the ones used in Adam Probe are main, mainly the one from Photonis uh, or from Hamamatsu. Uh, Kameka uses exclusively Hamamatsu. Uh, the guys in Stuttgart use mostly Photonis. Um, we also only have Hamamatsu plates. And uh, I'll show you in a second why. Uh, and the, the gain depends on how many MCPs you have and what the supply voltage is. Um, and usually um, we have two stage MCPs in Adam Probe. Um, and we go to, to about 2.1 kilovolts, yeah, so we have a gain of 10 to the 7, roughly. Um, so, as I said, if the, um, if the atom strikes, the, uh, strikes between the channels, it's not amplified, uh, but that has been uh, reduced drastically in the last couple of years by using so-called funnel MCPs. Yeah? Uh, and all modern uh, atom probes that you can buy currently use those funnel MCPs, um, and they essentially just processed MCPs, uh, where the areas between um, between the, the holes are sort of, you know, at an angle, so like a funnel. Uh, so you have an open area ratio uh, that used to be 60% is now 90%. The 90%, by the way, is just a marketing value. It just, uh, you know, Hamamatsu did a measurement of iron current on a regular MCP and then did it on, the, on one of those funnel MCPs. And they just found that, that difference. Uh, it measures iron current, uh, but there is no real open area ratio anymore. Yeah? So those, they take those 90% with a grain of salt. Uh, the difference here is now, of course, that it now starts mattering a little bit where the atom hit on the MCP. Yeah? And you can see the pore size here is 12 micron. That's also the, 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 the pitch that we're using in our atom probes. Um, yeah, and uh, so it's not relevant in terms of positioning. Yeah? But, you know, an atom might be energy, so the, 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 um, the detection might be slightly energy dependent uh, if you have something that hits somewhere where it just barely gets amplified. Yeah? Uh, and here's an example of early measurements showing that, uh, where you can see 
the full detection efficiency in this in this experiment with xenon and neon ions uh, for those uh, for those funnel shape MCPs is really only reached at three kV plus uh, and the full saturation at about five kV. Uh, so you've got the plateau uh, between about two and a half and four kV and then the full saturation at about five kV. And it's something to keep in mind, especially if you work with um, if you work with materials with very low evaporation field, maybe some nanowires or something like that, that if you have the funnel MCPs, you know that the saturation at those low <coughs> voltages might not be full. I mean, below 2 kV, this also starts applying to regular MCPs. Yeah, so if you've got extremely sharp samples, nanowires, something like that, this, this, this can be an issue. Um, another thing to know about those MCPs is how they are made. And essentially they are made by bundling glass fibers, uh, coated, coated glass fibers into bundles and stacking them. So, uh, and then eventually we just etch out like the, the glass in the middle here. Yeah? So why should we care? Yeah? The reason why we should care is because where these bundles meet, yeah, there are defects in the microchannel plates. And if you make uh, field desorption images from the add-on probe, you will actually be able to see those bundle boundaries, yeah? Because at those bundle boundaries, you have a slightly reduced detection efficiency. Yeah? Uh, and this is actually an image of that where you can see, you know, where you can see the hexagon where those bundle boundaries are. Okay, so now we've got our electronic signal. So how do we turn that into a how do we turn that into a detector signal? Now how do we turn that into an actual measurement of time and position? Um, and uh, the way we do that is by using a so-called uh, a, a so-called constant fraction discriminator together with a time to digital converter. I'm not going to go into the details of the electronics and how they work, but essentially what a constant fraction discriminator does is it takes the pulse that we get, which is not always the same. Yeah, so depending on where exactly you know where exactly your atom hit, and uh, even more so in the in the funnel MCPs, the amplitude of your pulse will be at, of different height. Yeah? People for years and years have tried to figure out if they can measure ion energies that way. That wasn't all that uh, all that. Uh, uh, helpful, but yeah, um, the, the, the amplitude can vary quite a lot. Yeah? And so in order to have a timestamp always at the same relative height of the pulse, yeah? because the pulse shape is always the same. And the pulse shape depends only on your delay line, on the electrical properties of a delay line, yeah? but the pulse height depends on how much charge you put in, yeah? and that varies. And uh, in order to, to get a signal at always the same time, we use an an analog electronic device called a, uh, called a constant fraction discriminator. Yeah? And that constant fraction discriminator essentially gives you a little TT, a, a little a rectangular pulse, yeah? always at the same relative fraction of height of that pulse. So it doesn't matter if the pulse is uh, 5 millivolts or, or, or 15 millivolts or 3 millivolts, yeah? it will always give it the same fraction of height. Yeah? That's why it's called fra constant fraction discriminator. Uh, the problem with that constant fraction discriminator is, you know, what happens if we have two pulses that are very close to each other? Can it distinguish it? And the dead time of such a constant fraction discriminator is roughly about three nanoseconds yeah, on a modern constant fraction discriminator. Yeah. And this is, this is a severe limitation for multi-hit capacity. Yeah. In our older detectors, it was even worse. Yeah. Three nanoseconds is already pretty good. Yeah. Um, but still, uh, our ions might impact closer to each other than three nanoseconds, either in time or three nanoseconds in space. Yeah? So our delay line has a certain propagation speed, typically about a millimeter per nanosecond, yeah? there or thereabouts, plus minus depends on the exact setup of the delay line. Yeah? And so the same, the same thing, you know, if you say three nanoseconds, it translates to about three millimeters. Yeah? So if they hit very close to each other, we also have a problem. Yeah. Uh, and this constant fraction discriminator then sends a pulse into the time, the digital converter, uh, which just takes the time and converts it into a timestamp, just saying, okay, this was 
355 point this much um, uh, this much nanoseconds uh, and um, um, then we get a time signal for each of the channels um, and the limit hereby is that uh, that our uh, time with digital converters they also have a reference frequency typically 200 megahertz these days uh, 200 megahertz it, it translates to five nanoseconds and they can usually only take one signal per clock cycle yeah so one signal per five nanoseconds yeah? and this is the second uh, this is the second downside of, of most current systems yeah? But this is essentially the limitation in terms of multi-hit capacity of our atom probe detectors these days. Uh, can we get around that? Yes, we can. Uh, we can do that by digitizing the pulses just like I've done it here with uh, the oscilloscope. Uh, obviously, you can't read out an oscilloscope very fast. So it's not practical to do that for you know, uh, a, a, an atom probe that runs with 200 kilohertz because I would only be able to run it with 200 hertz, which is very slow. Yeah? But uh, these days we're starting to get electronics that are actually fast enough to do that. Uh, our colleagues in France have started doing that uh, already uh, 20 years ago, uh, almost. But at the time the readout was much, much too slow. Uh, but now the electronics are moving into a, uh, into a range where this is possible and we are gonna start doing it in Erlangen pretty soon as well. Uh, good, so what is state of the art with delay line detectors? Um, so we get single and multiple particle detection. We get spatial resolution of better than um, uh, 45 microns. So about 20 microns is fine these days. And we get about 200 picoseconds, 100, 200 picoseconds temporal resolution. Yeah. This is standard. Um, so most more, uh, so in, in the LEAP systems, uh, what you have on top of that is a redundant delay line. Yeah, so well, because the, the, the dead time, that area has this cross shape yeah, because it's specific to one direction always. And if you have a redundant delay line, you can, you, can, uh, uh, you can actually recover anything that's happening here, 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 and here. Uh, this was patented, but the patent ran out last year, last summer. So by now you can actually freely buy those detectors and they are offered by Rontec, they're offered by a surface concept, yeah, so you can buy those freely now. Uh, and so the last thing we're going to jump into is reflectrons. Yeah? Uh, so reflectrons, as I've mentioned, as I've mentioned earlier, is uh, is a device uh, to recover uh, some of the uh, ambiguity that we get from energy um, um, from energy variations in voltage atom probe. Yeah? And the trick that we can apply uh, to to get rid of those is actually to have the ions fly around in a curve. Yeah? Uh, and the way that works is you have a so-called reflectron mirror. Uh, there's a couple of ways you can do that. There's some, some things like portion reader lenses and so on and so forth. Uh, but what we really have is reflectrons, electrostatic devices. Uh, and what the electrostatic device does is reflect your ions. Yeah? So you have an entry mesh that the uh, ions need to go through twice. That's why you lose some ions yeah? and you get some, uh, some some uh, deviations in also in the, in the ion trajectory, so you wash out some of the resolution. But the good thing is that ions with a bit more energy fly deeper into the reflectron than ions with less energy. And if you do it right, uh, then that cancels out energy variations to a first order um, uh, that happen during voltage pulsing. And so you get a, uh, you get a, a much increased voltage, uh, much increased uh, mass resolution on your voltage atom probe. Uh, it doesn't, in principle, do anything for, for laser atom probe. In laser atom probe, it's just the increased flight time that helps, yeah? Because the reflectron usually means you have more flight time as well. Uh, and, and I think about 80% of all atom probes have those, uh, those reflectrons, uh, um, yeah? And this is also uh, patented with some curved, funky uh, electrodes and so on and so forth. And a good thing is you get much better mass resolution voltage mode. Uh, you have a longer flight path, so you get better mass resolution laser. And it also partially compensates energy losses during the ion dissociation process that we talked about earlier. The downside is, is uh, low detection efficiency yeah, because they of the meshes that you need in order to terminate the fields. Yeah. Um, sorry, this is for older atom probes. Now with the MCP, funnel MCPs, it's, it's higher than that. Um, and any neutrals you formed in ion dissociations also hit the back wall, so they're gone. 
but you can get to some pretty pretty good master solution as yeah, so this is this is why it's usually worth getting them uh, even though they have some some downsides as well um, there have different gener been different generations of atom probes with different reflectrons and here just a bit of a a teaser also for tomorrow so you can see we've put a grid in the path of the ions yeah? uh, and the grid is the same between the two instruments so this is a leaf 4000 here in Erlangen and a leaf 5000 in Oxford and you can see the newer reflectrons have a much much larger collection angle so both of them are at the same scale yeah? so you can see in the leaf 5000 you get a lot more data um, from your specimen compared to the leaf 4000. Mm. And I'm looking forward to see whether they've done anything in the leap 6000, you know, would be even nicer if this would be expanded a bit more. But we're going to talk about that in depth tomorrow then. Uh, okay, the pulsing system, a pulsing system, voltage pulsing system is relatively easy. Uh, uh, is you have some pulser that you can buy. Uh, there's a couple of companies out there that make pulsers. Uh, so the, the, the guys in France and I have recently bought all of our pulsers from this Russian company. Um, and yeah, they are just uh, pulses with about uh, about a nanosecond or two or three pulse uh, duration. I've also ha I also have some older pulses here from old uh, atom probes, which have five nanosecond pulse duration, three to five nanosecond pulse duration. But yeah, with modern uh, pulses, you're more like 1.5 nanosecond and sub nanosecond rise time, uh, and this gives you pretty good mass resolution these days. And I've showed that already earlier. Uh, in, in our system, it's just essentially you regulate the voltage on the pulser, you tell it how often we should pulse, uh, and then you use the signal after attenuation, also in a constant fraction discriminator, so it doesn't get any shifts, um, to trigger, uh, to tell the machine, uh, to tell the TDC when the time measurement starts. Uh, and so this setup is, is actually fairly simple. The only thing you need to do is to match the impedance of the entire system uh, as well as you can throughout in our case it's 50 ohm um, and um, yeah and we've done that and we've done our homework and um, yeah getting some pretty good results there uh, and I'm gonna jump to that with the laser atom probe uh, it's a little bit simpler because what you do is that so this is a sketch of the uh, earliest laser atom probe in France uh, uh, where you have a uh, where you have a pump laser that goes into a frequency conversion unit uh, so a wavelength conversion conversion unit then you have some uh, then you have some photodiode in order to measure the start time yeah again you need a start signal and then you have in this case polarizers some mirrors and a power meter to tell you how much laser power you actually have um, and then uh, you focus your laser onto your sample yeah? And you know it might be that you have a relatively sm large spot uh, or a relatively small spot. Yeah. Um, yeah. The the one thing that is actually important here, if you want to build one, is that if you go to very short wavelength lasers, the laser photons can trigger the microchannel plate. Yeah. So you have to make sure that either uh, you throw out any signal that's caused by your laser, uh, or you make sure that your laser that your that your photons don't don't reach the detector. But it's uh, just something that's, that's, that's important if you want to build your own laser atom probe. Yeah, uh, so this is the earliest setup in, in France. So you can see, you know, the, the optics here just on an optical table and, you know, some, some lenses on, on aluminum profiles. Yeah, so this is, this is essentially the way it worked. And um, these days, you know, we're not, uh, this is, I think this is Francois uh, back when he still had hair, yeah. Uh, when he still was young, and you can see him uh, on on this uh, on this very instrument. Um, yeah, uh, today. So what's uh, what's essentially uh, what's essentially uh, what we're getting today uh, with leaps is you know uh, we get a large solid angle um, because the wide angle reflectron or a large detector. Of course, you can buy the large detectors also from other vendors. Uh, we have uh, these days about you know 10 million atoms an hour you can go faster if you want uh, essentially the detector is not going to be the limiting bit so our detector can take 5 million hits per second yeah, on uh, as, as random hits yeah, but that's not the limitation uh, we can go to, to ppm level um, 
honestly I don't remember where I got that slide from so I, I apologize if that person is somewhere in the is somewhere in the um, um, uh, is somewhere in the audience uh, so we've got relatively large uh, volumes we've got good mass resolving power uh, and we can work on microchip arrays uh, uh, in order to make to have a simple sample preparation um, yeah this is uh, this is just a leap setup and I think we're gonna cut it off at this point uh, yeah and this is sort of what we're operating with today Okay, so do you have questions about the Atom Probe instrumentation? And there was a very quick rundown, um, and obviously there's a little bit of depth to all of that. No questions.